Okay, you're watching Movie Night Extravaganza. I am here, as always, with my co-host, Jay Andrew World, with uh, J.G. Michael, host of Parallax Views, and with Joseph McBride, who, uh, you know, among other things, is a film historian, a cinema professor at San Francisco State University, the co-writer of the musical uh, Rock and Roll High School, and author of several books, including uh, Frank Capra, The Cat uh, Catastrophe of Success, um, which is, you know, yesterday I, I listened to the uh, the episode that you did with JG talking about Frank Capra and, um, you know, just uh, the fact that he really just didn't live up to any of the politics that we associate with any of his movies, which um, is, is interesting because I didn't, I didn't know that until talking with uh, JG about that. But it also makes sense, I think, that he worked with um, Jimmy Stewart, who is another person whose politics definitely didn't live up to any of the movies he was in. I mean, he was kind of a incredibly reactionary Reagan Republican, at least <laughs> at the yeah, end. They're quite different from their image, but still great filmmakers. And <clears throat> a lot of what I do in my film books is to try to reveal things that are hidden, you know, uh, things that are unknown about people or, uh, or people who are misunderstood for one reason or another. That's uh, what I think part of the job of the film historian is. Yeah. And, and I, um, I was going to say, Forrest, you forgot to mention that uh, Joseph was in the Orson Welles movie, The Other Side of the Wind. Yeah. Um, it, you were in the, the documentary that they made about it, too, right? Um, well, yeah, there are two documentaries about it. Uh, Netflix doesn't want you to see one of them. It's called The Final Cut for Orson, 40 Years in the Making. Yeah, when you go on Netflix, click on a little link that says trailers and extras. They hide that in there. It's really interesting about the post-production. They were more concerned about the main documentary that they finance called They'll Love Me When I'm Dead, which is about the making of the film and the trouble Wells had trying to finish it. But then Frank Marshall, who was one of the producers who finished the film, did this uh, fascinating 40 minute documentary about the post production, which was amazing. I was involved all along the way in one form or another, but they finished the film through netflix and it took 48 years to come out i was acting in it for six years when i was quite young so it's an yeah. amazing story. um i think I, I remember seeing i think i saw the love me when i'm dead i, I don't know if i knew that there was the other documentary yeah, nobody, um, nobody knows that because they hide that really carefully so watch, yeah you'll enjoy it I think. <laughs> yeah i i enjoy hearing about orson wells i'm like incredibly fascinated um with him as a filmmaker and just with a like as kind of a tragic figure i think kind of the most tragic well, I, um, I question that to some extent because um I, I have a book coming out it's whatever happened to orson wells a portrait of an independent career i wrote in 2006. i've done three books on wells and this one i've just updated this one to include the completion of the other side of the wind and the rediscovery of his early film too much johnson i take issue with the idea that he's a basically a tragic figure. Sure, he had a lot of tough times and some tragedies along the way, but mm -hmm. I think of him as a triumphant figure who managed to keep making films all his life. I mean, he, when he died, the New York Times said in its obituary he'd been inactive as a director for the last several years, and they actually had to run a correction. It just wasn't true. He was shooting film every day. The thing was, he was yeah. shooting outside the system. And if you work outside the system in America, you don't exist. You know, he's outside the commercial system. He was making independent uh, films totally on his own. And uh, the thesis of the book is basically he was doing that from the beginning of his career. And briefly, he had the resources of, of, of a major studio or two. Um, but he was always an independent and maverick. And I think that's uh, to be admired, you know. Mm -hmm. No, and I, I definitely admire Orson Welles a lot. Um, you know, as someone that wanted to be a filmmaker, still wants to be a filmmaker, um, kind of has always hit 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 a wall i guess when it comes to actually coming up with uh creative projects that aren't just kind of like podcasting or like short documentaries or something like that you know so we we'll about podcasts or something <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you know because we live in an electronic world a digital world and, and you could I've, I've told my students you know if i were making films today i would make films about people who are separated physically but are connected through zoom or something like that and you could do like a you know a love story about people interacting on screens like you're doing or something like that I, I i don't know what plot i would do but you, know, you could you could deal with our current reality and uh, come up with some interesting things and shoot it very you could you can shoot a film very cheaply gary graver who is wells's cameraman i asked him in the late 90s i said how cheaply could you make a film today and he was just getting into digital at that time and he said under a thousand dollars 
so all you need is a camera and anybody can buy a camera for a few hundred dollars uh and you need to feed the crew and the cast and you can do that cheaply and that's about it so you yeah. can come for almost nothing if you can um get some locations uh, you know borrow locations that, that some friends have and um you can get actors and crew to work for nothing uh, in exchange for credit i come from the rogers corman school of filmmaking where he didn't really pay us much uh so i'm i'm into super low budget filmmaking and wells was too uh other side of the wind was a pretty low budget film although it started getting more and more grand and expensive and that was part of the problem but um, by today's standards he was shooting very cheaply he had a small crew and uh they were mostly like 19 year old guys and a couple of women and uh you know they were dedicated to him and and most of the actors worked for nothing you know and things like that you can do that today yeah and uh so i guess i guess transitioning to um a filmmaker who was um doing something i think in some ways similar to what orson wells was doing which is like this um this cinema verte almost expression of uh real but fictional at the same time of course is billy wilder doing sunset boulevard which you know i mean flawless transition right there i guess but um <laughs> <laughs> he was um making a, a quasi documentary about hollywood when i met him i i came from wisconsin and I, that's that's where i got interested in films and i thought the film was too harsh a portrait of hollywood i i thought writers complained too much and you know then i got to hollywood and I was living in a dump, uh, you know, I had to get a place real quickly. And I found out it was right down the street from where Joe Gillis lived in Sunset Boulevard. I mean, like three blocks away. And then right around a couple of blocks, the other direction was the hotel where Nathaniel West set Day of the Locust, which is the greatest Hollywood novel, which is really a horror show. And so I was living in- Also a movie with uh, Karen Black. Yeah, not a, not a good movie, unfortunately. But read that book, it's just a great, great book. But anyway, I was in the midst of this uh, hellish environment. And uh, so I, I told Wilder when I interviewed him, I said, uh, I interviewed him a lot. I said, I, I, I realize it's kind of like a documentary on Hollywood. And he said, it's a Valentine. I love that. Yeah, uh, it's, yeah it's, I, I, I heard that. I heard you kind of tell that story when you were talking to um, JG um, about about at the end of the Capra thing, which I thought was really funny that we have we have you on here talking about Sunset Boulevard because at the end of that interview, uh, JG says, um, you know, I hope you, I hope you do an episode or something on uh, Sunset Boulevard soon. And right. so it's, it's cool that we're doing that all um, now. Um, so I, so I have um, a couple clips of Billy Wilder. I thought this one was interesting, getting us into the, um, the actual, I guess, um, meat of Sunset Boulevard as a film, um, kind of to set it up. Uh, you know, talking about kind of the process around it. Thanks, uh, Gary Pickford, the name of Big Fair, and, and, and uh, I, uh, uh, not me, Bracken, the Republican. He started telling her the story, and I was blanching. I said, oh, my God, if she finds out that she's gonna, he's going to pay the guy to, to sleep with her. And I said, uh, I said uh, Charlie, I, I think we made a mistake. I, I, I think that this is below the level of Miss Bigfoot. Miss Bigfoot is, in, is in, uh, and I can't see. Is it? This is impossible. Just, forgive us, please. Let's go, Charlie. Let's go quit. And we just kind of. Then uh, we had. There was just every actress with a little. Then we got Swanson, and we would go to the front office. I think it was Buddy the Silver. Then it was I in the studio. And she says, "For Christ's sake, Swanson, that's a piece of used toilet paper. You." crazy she's acting all over the place like this she says but that's what i want i want to have a silent actress playing now with sound and we just see the, the exaggerations the wildness the craziness now is the right about the picture or the play it says of course it is lacking the genius of gloria swanson it was it we were very lucky this kind of this was one of those things you know where we just kind of uh, uh it, 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 falling into a tub of butter, you know, it just it was easy. It, it just worked itself into something real and in something that could happen, and people that we knew and we did not lie about them. Uh, and, to, and 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 we had, you know, if you have if you have a picture, you know, where where the the the, the leading man, the leading man's uh, line was very simple. 
I came to Hollywood because I wanted the pool. I got the pool and I died in the pool. Once Yeah, he left out one interest, a couple of interesting facets of. I like your clips of Swanson. What a what a grand silent movie actress she was. And yeah, she she did these wild, extravagant films, but she also did some simpler films. There's a beautiful film she did called Manhandled, directed by Alan Dwan, which is about an average uh, shop girl in New York. It's just really delightful. But um, what happened was they were having great trouble casting this film. And as Wilder said, they went to Mary Pickford and they realized she was wrong for the part and they got out of there. But they also called Paula Negri, who was a great silent star, and she'd worked for Lubitsch a lot. And they found out her accent, Polish accent, was really heavy, and that's why she didn't make it in sound pictures. So they were kind of stuck. And they went to George Cooper, who's one of my favorite directors, and he knew all the great actresses. And he said, well, you got the perfect actress, Gloria Swanson. You know, I mean, like that was his, his stroke of genius. So he called her up, and I guess Paramount insisted she do a screen test, and she was terribly offended because, as she says in the movie, I made Paramount Pictures, you know, when she's driving through the gate, that great scene, and the guy doesn't recognize her. She says, without you, there wouldn't be a Paramount Studios. And anyway, so she was offended, and then Cooper called her up and said, are you crazy? This is a great part. Do the test, for God's sake. She came out, did the test, and she got the part, and she was just perfect. And he, um, Wilder wanted the grand uh, style, but he toned it down to some extent. Also, a beautifully directed uh, film. And then he got William Holden, kind of serendipity. Originally, they cast Montgomery Cliff, and he pulled out about a week before the start of shooting. And the story was that he was, um, I mean, we know he was gay, but he was sort of kept by an older woman, a rich older woman, and uh, he got anxious about his fans thinking ill of him in this part. And he pulled out, and then they got Holden, who per proved to be the perfect actor. Wilder says in the Cameron Crow interview book, Crow says, "What actors do you most identify with, or whatever?" He says, "I love Mr. Holden. I love Mr. Holden." He said it three times, and then he <laughs> said once to Holden in the fifties. Uh, Holden was asking his advice about buying a work of art, and he said, "Well, if I were you, and I am." You know, so he really identifies with Holden, and Joe Gillis, the struggling screenwriter. Uh, is kind of the patron saint of all of us screenwriters. I was a screenwriter for 18 years. I could talk about that. But we all relate to that guy. He is, I mean, it's so accurate, that film. But it's also kind of captures the the, the romance of the movies in a way, too. The kind of the, the excitement and the fun and the craziness of the movies. And and really, I mean, I think a lot of it is captured in uh, Gloria Swanson's uh, or Norma Desmond's house within the movie and i mean it's so beautifully shot it almost looks like a prison at times because of the way that the shadows um fall on the windows and the doors like you know there's moments where you can see it's like looking through the through the window and it looks as if like you know william holden and joe gillis is in his prison um, yeah it's um uh shot by john seitz who is a silent cameraman who worked with valentino who we, we saw in some of your wonderful clips that you assembled and and uh, yeah, it's claustrophobic, but it's it, it was not on Sunset Boulevard. Sunset wasn't as developed as it is now, but they found a house in the Mid Wilshire District, which was where Carla Hills grew up. She became a government official later on, but it was this grand old house that was torn down later. But the house is, is a, one of the stars of the film. It's just great. And he is like a prisoner in there, but he's desperate because his car is towed away. And Wilder said later, you know, if you believe that scene, it's because that happened to me when I was a struggling screenwriter. Uh, one of the things I write about in my book, whatever happened, uh, actually, whatever happened, Billy Wilder, Dancing on the Edge is my new book. It's it's now out on uh, Kindle and it's coming out in hardcover in a, uh, in a few days. Uh, it's a critical study of his work from the beginning to the end. And I really traced all of his scripts in Germany and early Hollywood and the films he wrote and directed. <clears throat> and uh, he really understood this guy, Joe Gillis, who was pounding the pavement trying to sell scripts because Wilder, it's kind of forgotten, but he went through a period of several years in Hollywood where he was really desperate and uh, living in the ladies' room, he said, at the Chateau Marmo, and women would come in and pee and all that while he was trying to sleep on a cot in the ladies' room. You know, things, he has great stories about that. So he really knew what it was like to be a desperate screenwriter. and. Um, uh, he, one of the jobs he had in his early life was um, he, they, uh, a producer paid him $50 to show up at a party and jump into the pool fully clothed just to entertain people, you know, which is humiliating. 
but so Joe Gillis there's a great line in the narration where he says the poor dope he always wanted to pool on you know now he's got a pool on it, but he's lying dead in the pool it starts it's very daringly uh narrated by a dead man which was unusual at the time very unusual it was later done in american beauty rather well but wilder came up with that as a kind of uh, partly an accident because it started with him dead and he's narrating as a dead man and you see his body being picked up by the guys from the morgue and the police and they take it downtown you can see a little a few snippets of that on one of the dvds and people laughed at that at previews uh, because he's lying there in the morgue and he's with a bunch of other ordinary people and they all get up and start telling their stories and showing how they how they got to be dead and the audience thought that was ludicrous so he cut that out there he was sitting at, at a preview in i think rochester new york he, he went out in the lobby he was so upset he was like this and some lady walked by and she said have you ever seen such a piece of crap in your life and wilder said no i haven't man and so he cut that out but then he was left with uh, it starts out with uh, the guy dead but it's a great opening with him floating in the pool and then he basically says do you want to see how i got like this one of the things i think is very charming about the film is that he gets to narrate the film he gets to tell his own story he rewrites his life as a movie script basically uh wilder is giving this poor guy one more chance to write a film you know a big big a production and it kind of i mean the way that wilder um i think relates to this character is kind of the opposite of what you guys are talking about with capra where capra kind of um, lied about his entry even into the film industry being like, you know, um, I was, you know, I suddenly like came into the film industry and directed a film and like, you know, I was this genius from day one. And when you were writing that book, um, you later found out that like he had basically worked his way up and done all of these, you know, um, smaller jobs in different film crews and then eventually, you know, became a director, which, um, it, you know, I think is something that uh, Wilder is incredibly honest about in all the interviews that I've watched yeah. with him. Yeah, Wilder was a, a, an honest man. I mean, he was a newspaper guy from way back, and he, he believed in telling the truth. That's one reason I admire him is he did exposés on film. You can, Truffaut once said you can tell a director's prior occupations by the films he makes. And Wilder was kind of like an investigative journalist all his life, doing exposés of Hollywood and one thing or another. And like the, the newspaper business and Ace in the Hole, he does an expose of that. Uh, and I like that about him being an old newspaper guy. I related to him immediately. I've been a newspaper guy since the sixties and I met Wilder on the set of the front page. I'd been writing, I've been writing about him now for 51 years, but I went on the set of the front page and spent the day with him and had a wonderful time. And, um, but he, uh, Capra, I, I, I call these directors creation myths. They, uh, most of them have a myth like Spielberg claims he found an empty office at Universal and set that up. It's just not true. I just proved that in my book. I think it's much more uh, admirable what Capra did. He started out literally cleaning up the horseshit is what he told me finally. But I, when I interviewed Capra for over a year for my book, the game I played was I had to find out the information from other people and then he would confirm it and expand on it. So I met a guy from his neighborhood, his next neighbor, uh, Rocky Washington, who was, became the first black lieutenant in the LA Police Department, a really great guy. And he said, oh, we were in the neighborhood. We were all very excited to hear that Capra got a job at a movie studio. And he was a, just a janitor, but we thought that was cool. So I told Capra, and I said, oh, yeah, I was just cleaning up the horse shit at the Christie Brothers Company. But, you know, he worked as an assistant director, cameraman, um, actor, writer, gag writer. And he even developed film. He made documentary films, all these things before he supposedly walked in the door in San Francisco in 1921. And so hi i'm a hollywood director it's just nonsense that really slights the profession of director because you really have to do a lot of work to prepare for it i tell my students that but also it's a form of self-aggrandizement it's i'm such a genius i could just walk in the door and make a film but wilder didn't do that wilder paid his dues he was a journalist for a long time in vienna and berlin and then he was a, a journeyman screenwriter in, in germany and i tried to see all the films that i could and i wrote about those they're very interesting um, he was frustrated because it was the time when Hitler was coming and the German industry was being taken over by uh, far right forces. So he had to struggle against that. And then he had to flee Hitler and he went to France and then he came to Hollywood and he was, he actually, the films he made in Hollywood early on were even uh, worse than the films he was working on in Germany for a few years until he met Charles Brackett, who was his first important collaborator who worked with him on 
Sunset Boulevard. They started in 1936 and they kept going through Sunset Boulevard in 1950 and then they broke up. By the way, I should mention, I, I'm always religious about mentioning writers. There's a third writer on the credits of Sunset Boulevard. Nobody ever talks about a guy named D.M. Marshman Jr. And he was a Life magazine reporter who came to interview Bracken Wilder. And they were telling him they were kind of stuck on this story. It, hard to believe their original idea for Sunset Boulevard was Mae West would be this kind of crazy old star and she'd fall in love with Marlon Brando, who was this young guy. It was supposed to be a comedy, you know, and obviously it changed a lot. Uh, but Marshman came in and he said, well, why not have the old older lady uh, keep the young guy as a kind of, you know, kept man gigolo character. Suddenly the whole movie came. So in other words, Marshman thought of the whole movie. <laughs> asked Wilder, why, why did this guy get credits? Well, you know, he thought of this thing. And Wilder, as, as people do in Hollywood, they kind of say, oh, well, he just thought of this and that. Well, that was the whole movie. Marshall yeah. wrote another screenplay. He has a couple of credits on IMDb for TV versions of Sunset Boulevard, but he died a few years ago, and his daughter said he was just really super proud of having worked working on that, that film, but he really made a major contribution. Um, and originally the, the Mae West and Marlon Brando one was supposed to be a, a Goldwyn production, right? Um, I don't know I, about I think and... Wilder was working for Goldwyn around that time, but it, he had a kind of mixed view of Goldwyn, uh, who was a colorful guy who loved movies, but he was a Bulgarian and kind of hard to relate to for Wilder, but it could have been. I don't know for sure about that, actually. But uh, the Wilder um, was I was listening to an interview that he did in the 70s where he was breaking down all these different uh, producers he had worked with, and I'm pretty sure it was Goldwyn that he was talking about that um, they he had pitched it to him, and then Goldwyn was like, yeah, I love the idea, and then they had dinner or something, and then a couple of days later, like he basically heard, like, from somebody else, like, oh, Goldwyn decided, he went to New York and decided he hates the idea and he doesn't want to do it as a movie anymore. Oh, okay. And, uh, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's entirely possible because, you know, these things have long, complicated histories. And Brack had published some diaries a few years ago, which are very revealing. And from the very beginning in 1936, he was complaining about Billy Wilder. They really were not very compatible. Brackett was a quintessential wasp from back east from a rich banking family. And he was a lawyer and he went to Harvard and he was a member of the Algonquin Roundtable, very erudite fellow, but and a Republican what, from the clip we just watched, where uh, <laughs> yeah. where where Billy Wilder calls him uh, Bracket the Republican. <laughs> yeah, he's a Republican. Wilder was a liberal Democrat, a Jewish uh, refugee from Hitler, and uh, so they had clashes from the beginning. And temperamentally, Wilder was this mercurial guy who would wave sticks around the you know as he, he paced around the office, and, and that drove Bracket crazy. Bracket would sit there on a couch. And, uh, with a pad and write things, and Wilder would spew out ideas, and, and uh, that's the way Wilder liked to work. But Brackett didn't like it that Wilder was on the phone with uh, women a lot, making dates, or that he'd have a drink at lunch, and you know, one thing or another. So, all through the diaries, he's saying, I wish I could get rid of Billy Wilder and go off on my own, but it's sort of like a, a spouse in a bad relationship. They always say, I'm going to leave the guy the next morning, and then it never happens. Mm -hmm. but Finally, I found out in the diaries, it's very interesting, what finally precipitated their break was the House Committee on American Activities hearings in 1947, which was the major political crisis in the history of Hollywood. Uh, Brackett was in favor of the hearings, and he thought that people uh, had an obligation to give their political views to the government. Wilder totally disagreed. Being a refugee from a totalitarian country, he, he really thought he valued American freedoms. He loved America, although he saw our flaws and he criticized them in his films. But he thought that it was terrible for people to, like Dalton Tremblay to be asked for their political beliefs. And so he and Brackett had some very bitter arguments. And basically, Wilder said, I'm never going to work with you again. They were working on A Foreign Affair, which is a great movie, very political uh, satire, terrific film. But they really wanted to do Sunset Boulevard. You'd wonder why they didn't just stop working together. But, you know, I guess. A lot of collaborators like Gilbert and Sullivan famously didn't get along, but they wanted to finish Sunset Boulevard. Also, I think it was a form of protective coloration for Wilder, who stuck his neck out in support of the blacklisted writers and the Committee for the First Amendment, and he was against the loyalty oath that DeMille tried to put in at the Directors Guild. And, and uh, he was, you know, for a foreign-born director, that was gutsy. And uh, so he, he didn't, you know, he partly survived because he was collaborator with Brackett, who everybody liked, and he was a conservative. And Brackett was an early president of the Screen Directors Guild, and 
all that. And so Wilder kind of uh, needed some protective coloration. I think that's one reason DeMille is in Sunset Boulevard, as good as he is. It's a way of neutralizing your opposition is to put the guy in the film. He comes off as a very charming, sensitive, compassionate fellow in the film, even though he turns it down. But he wasn't at all like the, um, you know, right wing ogre that we read about who had his own private detective service investigating the uh, the loyalty of uh, Hollywood people, for example. Uh, you don't get that in the film. So Wilder kind of protected himself by having DeMille in the film, too. Okay. Um, I, I just wanted to kind of bring up, just since you brought up the... Uh, um, the, you know, the, the, uh, 1947, uh, hearings, uh, Ronald Reagan was deeply tied in that friend of the show, since we've, yeah. we've always kind of <laughs> tie things to, uh, to, to, to Reagan, you know, there's, there's uh, quite a few, uh, there's a quite, quite a few ways to tie Reagan to this. Um, yeah, yeah, I still can't find that painting I was telling you about the other, uh, you know, a few weeks ago. Um, I've yeah. been, uh, I took an art history class and there was this portrait of Ronald Reagan with a, uh, standing on like uh, like holding up like bloody dead babies, and it was all about the uh, the, the 1947 uh, hearing. And I literally cannot find the artist or the painting. Oh. Um, uh, and I, I can't figure out. Um, I may have uh, lost a book in a move, uh, well, which, which had that painting yeah, in it. So caricatures of Reagan during you know Iran Contra and, and the war in El Salvador and all that. Reagan was an interesting uh, character in that period. He was involved in the Screen Actors Guild. They had a meeting in November, actually early December 47. I got into the Directors Guild records and I found some secret documents. Early in December, the representatives of the Guild tried to meet with the studios and try to stop the blacklist. And Reagan was arguing to stop the blacklist. He said it was uh, unconstitutional, which was true, and it was against the laws of the state of California, which was true. And yet, and also when he testified as a friendly witness, which means, you know, not opposing the committee, he was saying that communists had the right to their opinions under the American system, the First Amendment, which is so valuable that a lot of people don't like it today because it allows you to be whatever political party you want to be, whether it's communist or fascist or whatever, as long as you're not overthrowing the government, that's the line you can't cross. Uh, and, uh, but uh, Reagan was defending communists' right to their opinion. And yet he was working as a uh, FBI informant. T10 was his code number. And his wife, Jane Wyman, was an FBI informant at the same time. So he was playing this double game like a lot of people in Hollywood did. And then once the, once the blacklist got going, Reagan ran a clearinghouse, one of these clearing agencies, to, uh, to uh, get people back to work. You know? Yeah, uh, JJ? Yeah, I just wanted to add to that, too. I, I think people forget, too, that McCarthy era, there wasn't just like – Blacklisting. There was also I didn't even know about this until uh, a few years ago. There was the whole issue of uh, people getting gray listed. Like I, I didn't realize that uh, you know Vincent Price was gray listed for being a, a pre war anti Nazi. Yeah. So I mean there there was even people being gray listed. I guess the, too. the gray list sounds like a Vincent Price movie. Yeah, gray right? list. Right. <laughs> Coffee asking. When I lived in Hollywood, I didn't know much about it. I was very naive until I got to Hollywood. And one thing I found very quickly, and it's even worse today, is Hollywood is terrified of controversy and political issues. I mean, they'll make films that are safe, you know, uh, that seem to take a stand about something but won't really rile people up. But they won't make a film like The Grapes of Wrath in 1940 or a film like The Best Years of Our Lives. You know, those were gutsy films back in the day. Uh, ironically, they were gutsier now. Today's movies are mostly made, you know, the theatrical films are for the adolescent male audience, which is 12 to 24. If you're an adult who cares about characters and dialogue, you have to watch cable TV or streaming, which is, you know, a different uh, medium. But uh, what happened was in the blacklist period, <clears throat> it wasn't just 10 people. It was initially 10 people blacklisted and went to prison. And then they, in 1951, they had a whole series of hearings. And there were probably about 300 people who were blacklisted. One of the fictions... James Burns, who was Truman's Secretary of State, who was the guy who principally uh, advised him to drop the atomic bombs in Japan, became the counsel for the uh, studios who put in the blacklist. It wasn't the government who instituted the blacklist, it was the studios to protect themselves. People forget that. And it wasn't Joe McCarthy. He didn't discover communism until 1949, really, as a, as a big issue. And this was 47. The studios were into blacklisting. 
But other, um, other friend of the show, Joseph McCarthy. Oh. <laughs> he was my senator for a while. I have some funny stories. Actually, I should tell this is a funny story. When I was a kid in 1953, my, my father worked for the Milwaukee Journal, which was a liberal paper. And McCarthy called it the Milwaukee Daily Worker. And so they had a recall drive in 1954 against McCarthy, and the, and the uh, bumper stickers said, Joe must go. So my parents put that on our station wagon and we lived in a kind of Republican suburb and I thought they meant me because I was seven years old. What did I know? <laughs> my parents were sending me a message. So I would creep out and tear the stickers off the car and my parents thought it was our Republican neighbors and so they put the stickers back on the car and I tear them off and I must, I mean, they say, um, uh, comedy is tragedy plus time. I, I now find it funny. I'm sure it wasn't funny at the time. But what finally happened was my dad put a sticker on the car and he stood in the window on his day off to watch what happened. And he saw his little son skulking around, ripping off the sticker, and he felt very bad about it. So I have a certain empathy for Joe McCarthy because he and I were being recalled at the same time. And uh, <laughs> the recall movements uh, didn't succeed. But soon after that, the Army McCarthy hearings came and he collapsed. But um, Yeah, but and, and his collapse was followed by his death in a really fucking short amount of time. Considering yeah, right. like how he was in his forties, right? Like, um, he wasn't very old at all, and his like collapse from alcohol, like his his obviously collapse from um the CIA getting involved in the Army McCarthy uh, hearings and kind of well, what his fatal mistake was, he went after the Army, which is bad enough because you know Eisenhower was president, he was general of the armies in World War II, and he was really but also was terrified of him. Yeah, well, he was he was he had an ambivalent relationship. He was trying to undercut him. Like Eisenhower is the guy who set up the TV hearings. He behind the scenes manipulated uh, one of the networks into running the hearings, which he knew would destroy McCarthy. But he never mentioned him in public by name. He didn't think he should dignify him by name. Like Biden doesn't mention Trump by name. He says the former president. But Eisenhower could have done more. But he did something. You know. He. But the point I was going to make with oh I, I uh, at the Army McCarthy hearings in the great film Point of Order, which I recommend. Uh, uh, McCarthy says he's going after the CIA next, and you know in American history, if you do that, that's it for you. Uh, yeah. But there were about 300 people blacklisted in Hollywood. We don't know the exact number because what James Burns told the studios was, deny there's a blacklist because it's illegal, but if you just deny it, we can get away with it. So even in the 70s, some friends of mine did a documentary called Hollywood on Trial, and they had Ronald Reagan in it. And they showed up at his office on Wilshire Boulevard at 9 a.m. And he was fully dressed and he had an American flag and a California flag behind him. And he was fully in makeup and everything. And he says, oh, there was no blacklist. You know, this this to me is like Holocaust denial. It's bad enough to be a Holocaust survivor, let's say. But to be told it didn't happen must be really painful. Yeah. But anyway, so there were about 300 people, as far as we know, who were really blacklisted. And then there were a lot of people who were gray listed who were kind of iffy. And they had to do things like write letters to the studios. I've seen some of these letters by people like John Hausman and Rita Hayworth, uh, you know, saying, I'm sorry for my uh, premature anti-fascist opinions, and I, I'm sorry for belonging to this group. But which, they which, stopped, that's they like such a dystopian, opinion. that's like such a dystopian a phrase, premature anti-fascist opinion. Yeah, it's very Orwellian. <laughs> yeah. So Wilder, um, as far as we know, he wasn't directly affected by the blacklist, except his films in the 50s, he kind of retreated into safe properties for a few years. He started making films based on Broadway plays. But he did allegorical films like Ace in the Hole is, is an attack uh, primarily on the press. But it's it, you could read it as, a, as an attack on the corruption in the country because of uh, blacklisting and, and, and the Cold War. And then Stalag 17, which is set in World War II, which was a safe subject by then. It's about informing. It's about the American uh, POWs. Uh, I think one of the guys is an informer. And uh, uh, so that's a lot of Hollywood films in the 50s are very interesting because they dealt with themes like betrayal and informing, but they had to do it in subterfuge ways in Westerns and other genres. But anyway, uh, Sunset Boulevard came right in the midst of all that. And there was a poisonous atmosphere in Hollywood, which I think contributed to that film because it's a very vitriolic film about Hollywood to some extent. And, you guys know the story about Louis B. Mayer. It's worth reminding our viewers, right? Um, they had a screening at Paramount. Louis B. Mayer was the most important person in Hollywood for a long time, but he was his power was slipping at MGM, and he was on the way out. 
But at the end of the screening, as Wilder walked out, Mayer was holding court in the Paramount lobby with a bunch of his stooges. And he was railing. Wilder gave different accounts, but the gist of it was this fellow Wilder, he um, he was an immigrant and we gave him a home and we pulled him out of the water and and now he's uh, attacking us and how dare he do this? He's exposing our dirty linen and we should we should throw him back in the ocean and uh, send him back where he came from, blah, 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 blah. And Wilder very bravely walked over to him and said, uh, Mr. DeMille, I'm Billy Wilder. I made this picture, Mr. I, I'm sorry, not Mr. DeMille, Mr. Mayor. And he said, Mr. Mayor, you can go fuck yourself, which I thought was great. Uh, and yeah, and that's, a, and that's a story he got a lot of play out of um, later in his career when getting interviewed about the studio system and, you know, the, his way of standing up to it. Um, I, yeah. But it, I think it, it took a lot of, you know, it took getting to a point where he could make something like Sunset Boulevard to have the courage to turn around and then go tell someone like uh, Mayor to go fuck himself. Yeah, it's, it's you know, when he said it's a valentine to me, he was kind of saying, well, you know, it's not completely an attack on Hollywood. It's this some of the romance of Hollywood is in it, the Gloria Swanson character. One of the ironies today from the... Um, the feminist point of view is that she's only a 49 year old woman and she's portrayed as like really old and fortunately today meryl streep and uh, judy dench and viola davis people like that are still bankable but in in, in that period women were kind of finished uh, a lot earlier but uh, what makes her seem really ancient is she's a representative of a dead art form which is silent films it seems yeah. like like an ancient period and so uh People have totally forgotten her, and it's really tragic. There was a story that they did a musical. Edward Lloyd Webber did a musical version of this. But before that, and Wilder was not happy about it, but Stephen Sondheim came to Wilder <clears throat> and said, let's do a musical of Sunset Boulevard. And Wilder said it shouldn't be a musical. It should be a grand opera because she's a dethroned queen. I love that. Uh, there's something grand and wonderful about her, even though she's crazy and she's uh, in denial of reality. And, and interestingly, wrote, Gloria Swanson um, wanted to be an opera singer before she wanted to be an actress. Which, really, she was really tiny, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other, the other, I, I need to throw this in here. Um, the other uh, thing that connects a Reagan to this movie is that um, at the end of her life, in her 80s, you know, she was, or she was in her 90s, I think, when she passed away, and like a year or two before, it was when Reagan had gotten elected, and she was the, uh, she was the chairwoman of uh, Senior Citizens for Reagan. Okay. Yeah. So, well, so let, as well as well known uh, with Joe Kennedy Sr., um, they were an item for a while in the late 20s, and they made a film together called Queen Kelly, which Eric von Stroheim directed. And he was known for being wildly extravagant, so she shuttered the production. And you see a clip from it in Sunset Boulevard. Wilder's two favorite directors were Lubitsch and Stroheim. He said his style was a kind of a strange combination of both. And uh, so they put in this clip from her watching. Queen Kelly, um, but she was a great character. She kind of reinvented herself as she had a TV show and she made a few films and uh, she was a survivor and really a, a fabulous uh, woman. But Holden went on to a great career, you know, and, and Wilder, uh, he won an Oscar for Sally 17. And then he was in Fedora, which is a, a, a fascinating but flawed Billy Wilder film from the seventies, which is kind of like a a reflection on Sunset Boulevard. I'd recommend people see that. It's a darker, even darker version of Sunset Boulevard. It's about the film business. Yeah. Um, well, I, have, I have the yeah. I have this clip of uh, I have this clip of um of uh, Gloria Swanson talking about Queen Kelly. Um, just as you said that, I was thinking, like I I had actually had that on the outline for the next clip. I was going to be like, here's here's so this is this is her talking about shuttering the production on it. Oh, okay, great. Queen Kelly is not a finished picture. The only thing that was rather um, difficult at the time was that he was uh, taking longer to do one third of the picture. We, of course, pictures have budgets and picture, that means a certain length of months to shoot a picture. Uh, I happened to become worried about what was being shot. And since the two people that were being put in charge didn't seem to have any control over the situation, I walked off the set one morning <clears throat> after it was very early in the morning and I had just had a cup of tea for breakfast and uh, went to the dressing room, my bungalow, where I lived actually, uh, and called New York and called the bankers and said, I think you'd better come out here because I'm worried. 
much of the stuff that we're making in this dance hall quote question mark um, I think is censorable and uh, the Will Hayes office will never allow us to, to show it and um, <clears throat> not only that but we have uh, 20,000 feet for the first third of the picture and uh, if we continue like this we're going to be all year and it's going to cost more than I wish to be responsible for. So like that the bankers were there. They didn't have jets in those days but they might they it, it, they were there before I knew it as if they'd come by their own kites or their own steam. And so we then I as a matter of fact I never saw von Stroheim from that day until actually we were making madam uh, we were making a uh, sunset boulevard fascinating we could tell how smart she is and interesting and uh, it's fun to yeah see. and and also you know um i think there's background on that which is after she worked for uh cecil b demille and and did those movies um she got involved with united artists which you know gave people the chance to um well gave like big stars the chance to kind of produce their own movies but a lot of times they would have to put up uh, some of the capital for it themselves. Mm -hmm. So if you were working on a movie that, that was going to tank and go way over budget, you were kind of draining your own bank account, um, which which was kind of when she got involved with uh, Joseph Kennedy uh, Sr., like the, you know, the father. Um, you know, he was helping her produce these films and had his banker friends kind of bankrolling some of it. But then yep. a lot of it would come from her own bank account, and it kind of ended up actually bleeding her dry um, throughout this period because she was yep. financing films that kind of either wouldn't get made or um, Joe Kennedy would say, oh, well, I can help you get it around the Hays Code censors. Don't worry about that. And then the, and then she'd have to like get involved with these really rigorous fights um, against the, the, the Hays Code people. Yeah, that, that kind of hurt her career. Uh, one of the oddities, her career kind of floundered, floundered around that time. But she did a film, The Wilder Road. The first credit he had after he came to Hollywood was a musical called Music in the Air, which is sort of a silly... Uh, Hammerstein and Kern second-rate musical. A lot of talent was involved, but it wasn't much of a film. But she plays a diva who uh, appropriates this young uh, songwriter uh, to try to control him and make him her boy toy. And it kind of relates to Sunset Boulevard. But ironically, when Wilder approached her, she didn't remember they had ever worked together. Maybe they didn't meet. But he was able to take her performance in Music in the Air and kind of modulate it for the film. But um, we, we all love uh, Joe Gillis. He's our, as I say, our patron saint because he's a struggling writer. I love the scene where he's typing in his bathrobe. Somebody once said they ran into F. Scott Fitzgerald when he was struggling to be a screenwriter. He's a great novelist, but he never quite figured out how to be a screenwriter. And he opened the door at three o'clock in the afternoon in his bathroom and they thought that was scandalous. But that, that's one of the good things about being a screenwriter. In my book, Writing in Pictures, which is a handbook on how to write screenplays, I wrote that one of the good things about being a screenwriter is you can sit in your underwear and write scripts. And, and the editor made me take that out. He said, do you really want to say that in the script? I said, well, yeah, one of the good things about being a screenwriter. But so Joe Gillis is pounding away on his typewriter, and he, he says, uh, the voiceover, Wilder felt, um, don't use voiceover just to tell people what they're seeing. Use it to add something to the scene. So he's he's giving sardonic views of Hollywood throughout, and he's kind of the voice of Wilder to some extent. But he's a real formed character, and it really helps for him to make sardonic references to put it in context. But he says, I was writing all these scripts. There were originals. Some of them maybe weren't original enough. Then he pauses and says, some were too original. <laughs> I can relate to that as a screenwriter. I was writing, I wrote it's something honestly scripts. I, I doubt it in Joe Gillis's case that they were too original. I feel well, like yeah, because yeah, he yeah, seems yeah, like the story about baseball. It's really trite. Uh, one one yeah. person I'd like to talk about who's neglected in this film is Betty Schaefer, the story editor, played by uh, Nancy Olson, who's still with us, a wonderful actress, very charming. Uh, when I was in in uh, Wisconsin, I thought she was too good to be true. You know, she's so nice and all that, and I thought she was bland. And then I came to Hollywood and I realized, well, the best people in Hollywood are these story editors who are usually bright young women in their 20s who went to some really good school and they're well read and I, I became friendly with some of them because they liked my work and they were nice you could talk to them and then they would they would try to pitch my scripts to their boss who is usually some 
crass older guy and the guy would say well that's too soft i used to hear that expression i used to hate that soft meant like humane about people or whatever you know it wasn't like mm -hmm. hurting each other so betty schaefer is actually a very believable hollywood character and wilder has a tendency uh, one of the things i counter in my new book billy wilder dancing on the edge is this myth that he's a cynical misanthrope you know hatred of humanity or whatever um i think he's a disappointed romantic is what his later collaborator il diamond called him um that he was um his heart had been broken many times in love and you know the, i mean he came from the austro-hungarian empire collapsed and then nazism came and they, he lived through a lot of upheavals he was an exile over and over again he found a home in hollywood but he was um he was not a cynic he was just a realist i said to him once i called his called him a cynic and I, without thinking and he said but if i'm cynical what adjective do you have for peck and pop pictures i thought that was a great call you know? <laughs> oh I, I wanted to put up the um pictures that you uh sent me yeah here i'm talking to him in 1995 i gave him the uh la film critics uh career achievement award in 1995 and, and so i talked to him a lot on different occasions he was a great interview subject because he was an old reporter and he knew how to really talk to the press and we got along well and and here i am on the set of the front page in 1974 looking very young and thin and uh, <laughs> i did an interview with him uh it was published in the real paper in boston in sight and sound and i interviewed il diamond and Jack Lemon, Walter Matthau, and the cameraman, and the producer. And so over the years, I got to talk to Wilder a lot. And Todd McCarthy and I did a big interview with him in 1978. Uh, all, a lot about his later career. I love his later films. And that's one thing that people tend to neglect. It, he made a lot of good films with Brackett. You know, they did Ninochka for Lubitsch. They did uh, Double, uh, actually, Double Indemnity, he wrote with Raymond Chandler, because Brackett thought it was a hor horrible story. But he liked the film. But they did. Um, There's a character that kind of reminds me of Joe Gillis in some way too. Walter Neff, like the not not the just the depression inherent kind of in it, and this style of noir where it's like the character at the center of it is not necessarily like a good person. They're kind, of, you know what I mean? Like they're he, he, kind of, he can deal with. Well, I was saying he he has good women in his films. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the people who are really good-hearted people, like Betty Schaefer, encourages Joe's better qualities, and then he rejects her. Unfortunately. You kind of want to scream at the screen at the end when he tells her to leave because she's his only salvation. But if he had stuck with her, she she somehow manages to maintain her integrity and and goodness in the midst of the cesspool of Hollywood. But quite yeah. often his characters are are struggling between corruption and trying to redeem themselves, get out of the mess they're in. And so um, Joe Gillis is one of those characters. He's you know his car has been repossessed and he, he has no money and and he takes whatever job he can get as a ghostwriter for this woman. And, uh, um, you know, he's humoring her and he becomes her um, uh, gigolo. Wilder in his early days was a gigolo of sorts. Um, this is well known. There are a lot of gigolos in his films or kept men. Uh, and, and he deals a lot with prostitution versus love. That's a big conflict in his films. Like, you know, prostitution is sort of the human condition in Wilder's films, but we can surmount it by actually loving somebody and that's the conflict in a lot of his films but in the 20s when he was struggling as a journalist he was working as a uh, tea dancer they called it ein tanzer at hotels in berlin where you would dance with uh, older ladies or just uh, you know girls uh, who were who wanted a dancing partner and he had to pretend to be this suave dancer and he wrote this wonderful series in 1926 called uh, it's all about being a, a tea dancer and it would make a great movie and it's a four-part series and i talk about it a lot in the book and he understood the humiliation involved in being a kept man and so that theme keeps coming up like in the Nachka, uh which is the, the literature um the character played by melvin douglas is, is a gigolo he's very suave and very charming and he's, he's not particularly uh, destroyed by it but you know he has to kind of get out of it and fall in love and, and be his own man and uh, poor Joe Gillis can never quite manage it because the system, I guess what Louis B. Mayer was upset about, it, 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 it indicts the system of Hollywood as a soul-crushing thing. DeMille says in the film, uh, 
something like 20 press agents working overtime can do terrible things to the human spirit. You know, the way they make poor Norma feel like she's a complete failure and worthless person when she should be reveling in her grandeur. If she were around today, she'd be honored at film festivals and stuff. But back then, they didn't have that. Yeah. Um, I wanted, this actually lines up perfectly with this last clip that I wanted to play. And then uh, Andy has a question quickly about uh, Rock and Roll High School that he, okay. he is going to tie uh, into this. Yeah. But, but um, yeah, so I wanted to wrap it up pretty, like, you know, so you could get um, off when, when you need to. But um, this is quickly, I wanted to, this is just a minute of uh, Billy Wilder talking about how he wanted to originally end this movie. And it plays into the same uh, quote that you just said about, um, <laughs> yeah. Finish the story. The Sunset Boulevard had 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 uh, had that 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 thing, you know, the 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 pool and the, and getting it and and then uh, and then and then uh, it was no other ending except uh, it's being shot. Uh, the daring thing was the daring thing was uh, that that uh, that after the murder and the police and all of that thing, and once one 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 character I could not get in that because that would have been wonderful. That the newspaper people are there and telephoning, and one on one phone I had had a harper, on the other phone I wanted to have uh, to have uh, 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 what's the name of the other gossip woman? Uh, Luella we'll start with who? Luella Parsons. Luella Parsons, and she's on the upper phone, lower phone. Get off here, little bitch! I I could not get uh, her because she knew that Ted Harper was an experienced actress, but. Uh, uh, no, no executive would come and say, "Now, just a second. I mean, is there going to be a lawsuit? Is there? Is she going to be arrested? Is she going to be in jail?" I said, "I have no idea. I know. It's, all I know is she's Miss Sugar. That's all. That's the ending. She talks to the audience." You know? Yeah. So. Um... I don't know. That ending makes a lot more sense in that context, I think, because you know she's sitting, uh, Hedda Hopper sitting on the on the bed, and she's like, "Oh, you know, I'm I'm more important as the press." And I think it would, you know, it, it would have been it would have made way more sense if the two of them had gone at it's it. A, and you know, the callousness of the press again. Hedda Hopper is uh, the actor um, uh, who played Chief Scar in The Searchers, Henry Brandon. I interviewed him about John Ford, and he said Hedda and Ward Bond ran the Hollywood blacklist and. He says, if you do that to a cowboy, you get hung. I love that quote. They were terrible people. And Hedda Hopper was one of the worst. And, he, and so she, she's a real viper in the film. But yeah, she's Miss Sugar. You know, he puts in these Yiddish uh, terms. Later, he, uh, his, his films are about becoming a mensch or a man. I.L. Diamond, I like his films that he wrote with Diamond later after he tried a few other collaborators. And then he settled with I.L. Mm -hmm. Diamond, who was very simpatico with him. And, and made a lot of great films in his later years, Private Life of Sherlock Holmes, Avanti, et cetera. That's another story, as they say in, in the Wilder scripts. But uh, Sunset Boulevard is a perfect film. It's one of those great, great masterpieces. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, you cover the Private Life of Sherlock Holmes in the book, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. And I have awesome. a long section on Fedora, which is fascinating as a kind of uh, final reflections on Hollywood. Very, very bitter film. Because he had been rejected by Hollywood, he and Diamond were kicked to the street, basically kicked to the gutter. Sunset Boulevard begins in the gutter, you know. I mean, that's that's his vision, you know. And then it moves up from the gutter and they take it from there. But yeah, I, I deal a lot with the older, uh, the later films, which I try to uh, champion. I've done that since they since the seventies when they came out. I've been trying to say, no, he's making great films in this period as well. And it's not just uh, let's look back at the forties and fifties. You know, he had a long, rich career. So that's one reason this book is just long. It's hard to even lift it. It's about 700 pages. Hopefully fun to read uh, because I go into his all the ups and downs of his amazing career uh, in, in Germany, uh, Vienna, Poland, before that, France, Hollywood, and back. And then he went back to Europe to make film, films later on when Hollywood kind of rejected him. He became a European filmmaker again here. He, like Lubitsch, he was one of those directors who interpreted America to Europe and Europe to America. He, was, he brought a cosmopolitan spirit to our films. That's one reason Sunset Boulevard holds up so well. It's extremely sophisticated and, and very uh, tolerant. And it's very compassionate toward Norma, Norma, even though she's kind of a tyrant and she's crazy. Even though uh, she's Meshuggah. Yeah, <laughs> she feels deeply 
for her. She's a tragic queen, as he says, and you feel deeply for Holden too. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, I just um, Andy, yeah, Andy, I was yeah this is actually question. a great transition to my question because uh, I, I kind of feel like Billy Wilder is is like uh, a lot like Alex Cox, which we've had a discussion about uh, punk filmmaking, and of course you wrote Rock and Roll High School, and since you know uh, we never like the the Lubrich touch, uh, we we never quite defined what punk filmmaking actually was, uh, although Lubrich touch has a better definition, it just has a bunch of them. So I just kind of was wondering, since you know we've had earlier discussions on this channel about uh, punk filmmaking, um, and you you know you wrote uh, a movie which I uh, would argue was more into the uh, post. Um, uh, what was that movie? Uh, uh, the the one that uh, uh, Lucas know. did. No, no, I was I was thinking more like like the seventies nostalgic. Uh, teen uh, uh style that that kind of gave us eventually animal house and um yeah. uh but, it's but anyway, american graffiti joseph the american I graffiti yes. yeah yeah american that was graffiti a wonderful was, movie but it was kind of wholesome and fun you know whereas yeah uh, but like like it kind of it kind of created the formula that that like um uh later movies like like porkies and uh animal house kind of uh filled in and and i think uh rock and roll high school kind of uh sits in that kind of camp but anyways like like what your thoughts about punk filmmaking are and if we could uh maybe just in general as the channel have a better definition well, making a movie with roger corman i'm sorry like <laughs> roger corman and the ramones by the way just just to add that in there if people don't know what we're talking about the ramones make that film special i mean it's a film that has never stopped playing and my son a few years ago said you know dad the only thing about this film that dated is vinyl but vinyls come back so hey you know but the Ramones, it was a stroke of genius to get the Ramones as the band. When I wrote the script, we didn't know who the band would be. And the Ramones, I like them because they hark back to the very earliest days of rock and roll, which I was into from 1955. And But they were very sophisticated songwriters. And uh, they dealt with subjects that the mainstream didn't want to deal with, like glue sniffing and child abuse and things. So they had trouble getting played on, on uh, radio. And so they never were destined to be a mainstream success, which is what partly what I like about them. And that's partly why they're authentic punk, you know, as punk is an outsider uh, rebel medium. And once you become mainstream, which they tried uh, uh, with Phil Spector and it bombed, they tried to do an album where they cleaned up and it just died. And uh, But they were a cult favorite. They're cult favorites and they still are. And that's what makes the film really work. But, uh, you know, I think the characters are good. It's based on a, um, uh, student strike my father ran in 1928 at his high school in Superior, Wisconsin, but I always kind of held it in reserve as a film idea, but I thought it was a little mild for the 70s until I thought of ending with a violent thing where they blew up the school, which I based on the students in 1970 when I was in Madison, Wisconsin, blew up the Army Math Research Center to protest the Vietnam War, and they killed a graduate student, unfortunately. And I, I covered that event, and so I thought, let's put in something serious and make it a serious political satire in the midst of all the silliness. And it is the material I was handed originally to rewrite was just silly. So I thought, let's add some political overtones. And also, my background as a Catholic school kid, I really understood fascist, repressive nuns and priests. And so Mary Warrenoff's character, the principal, resonates with people because she's so true as a disciplinarian. Anyway, that was a, that was a fun film. A lot of people worked on that. You know, I was one of the writers. It was one of those classic collaborations that uh, the parts were all all came together in a kind of unexpected way. And I'm glad you like it. And uh, it was, you know, one thing. I there was a book on Hollywood musicals in the '70s came out in the '90s, and I, I saw it at the bookstore. And I thought, oh, great! And I looked at the contents. Rock and Roll High School is not even mentioned. And I. I'm not saying it's cabaret, but you know it's a good movie. But it was so far outside the mainstream; it was made for two hundred eighty thousand dollars by Roger Corman that it didn't even count in the in the minds of uh, conventional people. Uh, and that's typical of like Orson Welles not counting in the minds of conventional people because he wasn't working in the, the mainstream superhero kind of movies. But I like people who work on the margins. I think that's some of the best filmmaking that endures. Yeah, and I think that's why Orson Welles has endured as long as he has, um, you know, yeah. working outside of a studio system that was really being, you know, repressive at the time to the point where if you pissed one or two people off, like, 
you know, you were you were done for, like your career was over. Yeah, and I think too, uh, the working in the margins is is a good partial definition of what punk filmmaking is. Hey, yeah. I, I just wanted to say real quick, uh, Joseph, I'm glad you mentioned Mary Warnoff because as much as the Ramones make that film, you know, uh, Mary Warnoff is my queen. So like yeah. her being in that movie, I don't think anyone should oh. sell her short. And she was punk before punk. She was a Warhol factory girl. Yeah, she's she's amazing. She's really tall and imposing and witty and sophisticated and she, she really uh, uh, nails that character and uh, I play one of her henchmen. I was a school board member. I had no lines and I was an extra in some films and I once asked an old extra, how do you get noticed in a scene? He said two things. Stand next to the person who has the dialogue in the scene. Stand next to the tallest person in the shot because the <laughs> camera will gravitate toward you. So I, I figured, okay, Mary Warnoff, she's my height, 6'3". She had the lines. I stood next to her, and she kept kind of looking at me, and then I'd look at her, and we'd give each other evil looks, you know, and it became like a little shtick, especially. <laughs> the but uh, it is a, a, one of those films in which uh, many disparate talents uh, pooled the resources, and it was kind of an unlikely success. But, yeah, I mean, Billy Wilder, too, I like him because he is a maverick. He was always a maverick. And uh, he worked within the mainstream system, though. He wanted to be successful and popular, and he... He uh, succeeded, had a long career, and then they kind of kicked him out the door when youth films came in and he couldn't quite adapt. And that's a sad part of it. But, he, he, you know, he didn't let it destroy him. He just, you know, moved on to other things. But um, he was, he challenged our system. He challenged the American way of life and he challenged our, our conventional views of men and women and, and humanity. And, and then got weirdly nostalgic for the system that he had kind of... <laughs> The yeah. him towards the end, if you listen to any of his uh, screenwriting, like, you know, his classes on screenwriting, like the or lectures on screenwriting that he gave, he gets all weirdly like nostalgic for uh, old Hollywood. He'll be like, he'll be like yeah. no, I think I think we should. I think I think, we, you know, this was really where I, where I shined. And, you're, you know, but yeah, it's I, like ironically, I did a book called The Book of Movie List and I had one list, 10 reasons why the studio system was bad, 10 reasons why the studio system was good. And it's encapsulated by John Huston saying, you know, when we worked in the studio system, we all kept saying, we wish the studio system would be destroyed because we'd have freedom. And then it was destroyed and we didn't have that freedom. And we realized, hey, it wasn't so bad after all. And guys like Wilder and Lubitsch and Houston and other people worked in the system rather well, but they had to be very clever to outwit censorship, which yeah. Lubitsch and Wilder- but, but I mean, if you're if you're going based on, you know, what's good and what's bad um, about the studio system, it kind of made some of the most ingenious filmmaking because it had to get past that censorship. Like, yeah, you yeah. Look at, yeah like as the Hayes Code kind of crushed a lot of creativity, the creativity actually bloomed again because people had to be creative enough to get it past the censorship. Yeah, they had to be clever. And uh, in my Lubitsch uh, book, How Did Lubitsch Do It? I have a whole final chapter on romantic comedies today, which I think are kind of dismal compared to Lubitsch's. Part of it is the old um, restrictions have broken down, so you could do almost anything. You can have people uh, uh, taking a dump on the street, and uh, you know yeah. in that terrible film *Bridesmaids*, and then follow it. Actually, there are two scenes in a row where they do that, which Wilder called humpback construction, which means you have the same thing happen in two successive scenes. But you know, Lubitsch didn't do that, and Wilder didn't do that. They had to be more subtle and sophisticated, and that's why those films hold up better. Than a lot of that silly stuff, uh, and uh, that's why we look back. I wish younger people, uh, you know, I'm teaching a class later today on Wilder and Lubitsch, and I'm showing since the Boulevard, oddly enough. And when I show these films to students, they think, "Wow, these are wonderful films. These guys were way ahead of their times." And Lubitsch, they love, and Wilder, they really love. I think he Wilder is a little more uh, troubling for people because he's um, maybe a little more close to us in terms of time, but. Um, they, they find them very sophisticated compared to the garbage that they're uh, dealt today, you know, frankly. Yeah, I, I first saw Sunset Boulevard, Sunset Boulevard, wow, because of a, a noir class I took my last semester of college. And we watched uh, 14 noir films in 14 weeks. And both Double Indemnity and um, Sunset Boulevard were in there. Oddly enough, as a kid, um, my dad and I watched Some Like It Hot a bunch of times because we had gotten it from a DVD store. and. We ended up watching it like five times, but I'm gonna let you go because you know you have office hours, so I don't want to. Yeah, so I'm a teacher, and that's my my gig, you know. And, and uh, but I like it because 
being a teacher, you talk to young people and you show them films and you get them excited about classic films and then you can write about them at the same time. So today I'm doing my Lubitsch Wilder class, which is great. Next week I'm showing some Lubitsch German films. I'm going back and forth between the two guys. They're very different, but very similar. But now I've written books on both of them and uh, it's kind of a natural progression. My next book is on the Coen brothers who I, I love. And to me, they're the modern equivalents of Billy Wilder. If he were working today, he'd be making films. Yeah, and there's and there's the connection between um, Tilda Swinton playing both like kind of the Hedda Hopper character and Luella Parsons in uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, they're very yeah. Yeah. toward Hollywood. They, I mean, they're very wicked and funny uh, satirists, uh, but they 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 kind of love people. They 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 call their characters in an affectionate way morons. You know, they love morons. Yeah. Because our country is full of about half morons, and we always have them, actually. <laughs> but so, I mean, not all their characters are morons. I mean, like the dude is not a moron; he's a very clever guy. But a lot of the characters are very wacky. But you know, they're they're kind of the heirs of Billy Wilder in today's world. So it's kind of a natural progression. So I, anyway, I hope people uh, will get this book, which is coming out from Amazon on September twenty fourth, and uh, it's already out on Kindle. By the way, if people are interested in buying it now. But I spent 12 years off and on writing that and, and 50 years writing about Billy Wilder. So he's, it's a dream come true for me because I just love Billy Wilder's films to distraction. I think he's such a great uh, filmmaking uh, marvel and, and I hope people get a kick out of it. But I really delve into what makes him tick and what some of the mysteries are in his, his life and work. And I hope that people will find that illuminating. Yeah, okay. and, I, and, and I hope you'll come back if we do another uh, Billy Wilder film in the in the future. Um, or Cohen's Brothers film. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that book is coming out in March. It's called The Whole Dern Human Comedy, Life According to the Cohen Brothers, which is that line from uh, Sam Elliott at the beginning of uh, Big Lebowski, The Whole Dern Human Comedy. And uh, so I would love to talk to you guys again. It's always fun, and you guys have great questions. And thank you so much. All right, yeah, thanks, thanks for coming on. And we're gonna we're gonna premiere this at uh, eight tonight, or at, probably at nine tonight when we finish our first stream on it. But yeah, cool. So um, I'll send it to you when we do. Thank you guys. All right, gaba gaba hey for the moms. <laughs> yeah.